I'm here with Theodore Boutrous of Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher, who so eloquently argued uh, for the plaintiffs uh, in today's case. Um, I just want to say one thing. Uh, the, the intervening defendants, homophobic and bigoted motion, I think will prove to be a real low point in American civil rights history. But it's our hope that Judge Ware's opinion and the ultimate decision in the issue that's before us today will end up proving to be a positive turning point and erase this dark spot uh, that was put upon us uh, by the intervening defendants today. Um, I also think it's important to remember uh, that the lawyers simply represent clients. Um, the proponents in this case um, led a campaign that we saw throughout trial that was incredibly bigoted, homophobic, and filled with animus. They attempted to hide that during the trial. And their motion that was argued today, I think, really brought to light and brought to the federal court system the homophobic and bigoted views of those. And just to remind you, the reason that we're here, and the intervening defendants in this case, Mr. Tam, Mark Jansen, Martin Gutierrez, Gail Knight, and Dennis Hollingsworth, are the actual proponents in this case. And I think it's important to remember their views and to remember the clients that are represented by the lawyers that you heard speak here today. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Boutrous, um, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, the, today we argued this motion, and, and this motion is a frivolous, offensive motion. It was deeply unfortunate that the proponents decided to file this motion. In some ways, though, it's not surprising, because throughout the civil rights history of our country, when uh, judges from a minority group have sat on a case where there was an equal protection claim or some issue that related to the rights of that minority group, litigants have tried this trick. They've tried to knock the judge off the case because of their status as a minority. And each and every time throughout our history, the courts have rejected those attempts. We're very hopeful that Chief Judge Ware will do that in, in denying this motion. You heard today, again, it, it, it echoed a bit of the trial where uh, Chief Judge Ware asked Mr. Cooper for the evidence to support their claim. And he asked him several times, and Mr. Cooper was not able to provide the answer. And as Chief Judge Ware said, Mr. Cooper left some of the key questions, the key question, unanswered concerning the evidence they have here for this motion. And um, as we talked about in court today and in our briefs, courts in race cases, gender cases, religious cases have rejected these arguments where litigants try to bounce a judge off a case when they're unhappy with the result because the judge is, is a, from a minority group. And here the proponents argue, well, it's not because of the judge's sexual orientation. It's these other factors. And they point to uh, the fact that the judge has a relationship, which is not exactly breaking news that someone might have a relationship. But this ploy has been used throughout history in civil rights cases. When litigants try to disqualify black judges from sitting on cases involving equal protection and desegregation and other cases of that nature, the, the argument would be, well, we're not arguing it's because of your race. It's something else. And, and same with, with women and same in terms of religion. And, and as uh, Judge McKaysey from New York once put it, you know, no matter how you try to hide it, it's the same rancid wine but in a different bottle. And that's what I think this motion is. I'm very surprised it was ever filed. Um, on the positive side, um, because this has been a pattern throughout our history where these kinds of motions have been filed in civil rights cases, this is an opportunity to show that the same principles that have applied from day one in civil rights cases in our federal judges will apply here. And, and, and we're hopeful that Chief Judge Ware will make clear that uh, gay judges, just like all other judges, are, are fair and impartial and, and adhere to their oaths. We know Judge Walker did. He had an extraordinarily fair proceeding, gave the proponents every chance to put on any evidence they wanted, invited them to put on evidence, but they couldn't do it because their claims in support of Proposition 8 are baseless. They had no evidence. That's why they filed this motion. This is a desperate Hail Mary pass they're throwing because they think they're going to lose. And they should lose because their the efforts to support Proposition 8 are, are without any merit or base, and they're totally baseless. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. What does it tell you that the judge thinks he can rule within 24 hours? I'm, I'm not uh, not going to speculate on that. I, I felt that he, the judge, really 
clearly had focused on these issues. He was extremely well prepared. He asked excellent questions of both sides. And uh, it, I guess I, this isn't speculating. It tells me he's, he's spent a lot of time preparing for today's hearing. He's read the briefs. He listened to the arguments. So uh, beyond that, I'm not gonna, going to comment. But I, I do think he was extremely well prepared and is taking this very seriously. And as I said, it's a serious issue when someone comes into court and tries to disqualify a federal judge based on their their sexual orientation. We hope the judge is going to reject that attempt. Were you surprised that Judge Ware acknowledged that he had uh, presided both over the uh, changing of the gavel and a, a gay same-sex wedding? Did that surprise you? I didn't know that. I, I did not know that. I was not surprised. And, and that, but I thought he did it with, with uh, some irony, given the standards that the proponents are advocating here for recusal of disqualification of judges. Um, if, if the, the Proposition 8 proponent standard was uh, adopted, we'd have federal judges having to, to disclose um, all the personal details of their life, it seems. So I thought um, it was interesting, and, you know, but it didn't surprise me, and, and he's, he, uh, I think it was, uh, it was totally appropriate and, and, and fine. If it was appropriate for him to disclose that, why wouldn't it have been appropriate for Judge Ron Walker to disclose? There, there wouldn't have been anything inappropriate about Judge Walker disclosing anything. The question is what is required by the law. And our view is that, first of all, that the proponents are asking for this sweeping new standard that would be extraordinarily intrusive of the federal courts. It would undermine the integrity and the authority of the federal courts. And um, it's a very, very dangerous precedent they're asking for that would sweep way beyond this case, way beyond cases involving gay judges. That's really the point here. It, it's, it's not that uh, anything uh, is, should, is, is inappropriate or appropriate is what's required by the law. And for the proponents to have waited this long to raise these issues, I think is proof positive they, they know these arguments are baseless and they filed them for some other reason than trying to win. Yes. Is there a mechanism by which um, the proponents of Prop 8 could have raised this issue once they had seen, you know, or something, you know, short of you know, the disclosures that we made in April, um, you know, within the context of the trial, was there a way that they could have gone to the judge and said, hey, what, you know, what gives, or, because um, if they thought it was so important, um, is there a legal way that they could have raised it without having relied on, you know, a, a news report that they didn't know what, what it was true Absolutely, they could have raised it. And what often happens, if some fact is publicly reported, and, and, they, and they never suggested they didn't believe the reports were, were correct, and, and, they, and, and they could have gone to the judge and, and asked, said, Your Honor, this was reported. We want to raise the issue. We want to make sure it doesn't raise any, any questions. That's how these things usually play out. Um, a, a litigant learns of some fact through public sources and, and, and oftentimes raises it with the judge. That's what they should have done. Instead, they 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 hid in the weeds, waited until they 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 it appears they they are going to lose, and then they 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 brought it as this last death ditch attempt uh, to shore up the, the the case. And I think it's it's very common to have issues brought up in that way, and they didn't do it. It's very unfair to the judge waiting until he's gone. That's why I think this motion is really, frankly, outrageous. Did you ever consider doing that, going to the judge and, and asking him to bring that up or disclose or, or we did. just to keep this from happening later? No, no, we, we did not think it was an issue. The cases are so clear that in this circumstance that someone's status, their sexual orientation, their gender, the, who they are is not a basis for disqualifying a judge. Once you go down that road, um, it's, it would be a terrible thing for our system. We trust judges to decide cases based on the law and the facts. Here, the law and the facts overwhelmingly supported our side, the plaintiff's side, and Judge Walker's opinion uh, ruling in our favor. And this is a case where um, the, the proponents didn't put on any evidence that supported their claim. Now they're in here arguing that it wasn't that failing, it was something else. It's just really kind of the classic disgruntled litigant coming into court, attacking the court, because they failed in proving their case. That's what's going on here. It's very disappointing that they, they took this approach. But I think, on a positive side, um, if we can get this issue resolved to make clear that gay men and lesbians who serve on our federal courts are entitled to all the presumptions of the partiality and fairness that we give to the judges throughout the country uh, in, in the federal court system. Thank you.
I know you don't like to make predictions, but how confident are you that 24 hours from now or maybe two days from now you're going to win this one? Put this, put this aside. We think that our argument is extraordinarily strong and that the other side's argument is frivolous. So we're hopeful the judge is going to deny this motion and do it in a way that makes clear that gay men and lesbians are uh, entitled to all the protections and the presumptions of impartiality and fairness that other judges are in our system. So we're, we're very hopeful that that'll happen and it'll come soon. Is, uh, is, is that ruling, if you were to rule in your favor, is that ruling appealable? And can you also talk about what is the status of the appeal of, of Judge Walker's ruling? Yeah, uh, first, it's, not, it's difficult to know whether the proponents would have standing in the appellate court. We'd be back to the standing. So it'll all come together at some point. Um, in terms of the status right now of the, the main appeals, the, the case in the California Supreme Court is basically fully briefed. I think there might be some amicus brief filings that are still happening. And then, according to the court's order, it's likely to be argued uh, no later than September. And, and then once we get a Ninth Circuit, or excuse me, a California Supreme Court ruling, I think uh, the Ninth Circuit will be able to move quickly uh, in responding to that, and, and we'll be off to the races again. Any other questions? Mark? Yes. Uh, did you push comments by the judge today to the you or encourage you to believe that he's going to I, I have a rule. You know, when I go into an argument, I say, don't, don't get happy and don't get sad based on what the judge says. And so I applied that rule today, so I can't tell you the answer to that question. Are there any indications you think that the judge gave that I, I just, you know, I, I, I personally never do that just because I don't want to jinx myself. Uh, I felt it went really well, but the judge focused in on the key issues. The fact that the judge focused in on the fact that the proponents don't have any evidence for their main argument, put aside all their other arguments, but their main arguments about uh, about Judge Walker, they don't have any evidence. They're completely speculating, uh, and, and that is inappropriate. When you bring a motion arguing that a judge should be disqualified, there is a very high standard for you to prove it's not because of their, uh, their status. And the proponents here completely failed to meet that standard. Uh, lawyers have been sanctioned for this kind of uh, this kind of motion where they don't have evidence and, and the fact that they could not point to any evidence in the record supporting them on what seemed to be the key premise of their motion seemed to me to be uh, the very positive development. Do you think they should be sanctioned for bringing this motion? We thought about bringing a sanctions motion but decided it wasn't worth the distraction here, that we'd be better off just focusing on the law and, and the facts here and, and getting a ruling that makes clear this kind of motion is inappropriate. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, what, you, what about the opening, sorry, making public yeah. the videotapes? When yeah. are we, when's, what's going to happen? The judge had said he would, once he ruled on the narrower issue today, he would then set another hearing for that. Hearing. So, yeah, so we'll be coming, we'll be coming back one more time on that. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, thank you all. Thanks.